<laughs> okay. Um, everything that's happening out there in the world has no solution from your point of view. Okay? Uh, it is perfect. Whatever's going on is perfect. People have enrolled for certain classes. People have enrolled to be the haves. People have enrolled to be the have-nots. Uh, if we perceive an injustice out there in the world, where is the injustice? One of my favorite sayings from The Course in Miracles. If you perceive an error, it is not the error that needs correcting, it is your perception that needs correcting. Okay? So why do we perceive it to be a problem that there are haves and have-nots? Why do we perceive anything to be a problem? Right? Because we have karmic guilt. Because inside of us, something knows I perpetuated that injustice myself previously. Own it. Okay? It's not wrong. It's not bad. Own it. It gave people an opportunity to learn and to grow. It was great. Okay? Hard to come around to the perspective that there is nothing going on on planet Earth but love because it doesn't look that way. But we look with our five physical senses, not with our inner senses. We have to learn to look at everything with our inner senses. If I see an individual in trouble, well, all Jesus said to do was pray for them. So pray you one for another. didn't say fix them, find out the cause, fight against the problem, right? No master teacher ever told us to do that. Never told us to correct anything, to fix anything, right? If you see a need, pray ye one for the other. It's a telepathic pool. We're all connected mentally. Okay? When we get healed, the whole world gets healed because we're connected to the whole world. We are the whole world. Is it possible? that however many of us there are, 20-some people in the room, is it possible there are 20 completely different worlds out there that we think we're looking at the same world, but we're not? There is nothing physical. There's nothing physical, right? It's all mental. It only makes sense that there are as many different worlds out there with as many different issues and problems and beauties and sunsets as there are people observing it. If there is no one to observe the world, does it exist? There's more going on here than meets the eye. <laughs> you know, what our five physical senses tell us, tell us is reality is not reality. If it were reality, it would be bad. If it were reality that one person could harm another, then it would be absolutely correct for us to try to fix it. But if we look at it from our inner senses perspective, we see somebody learning something that's necessary for them to learn in order to attain total awakening, state of joy, bliss, forever, nirvana. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we'll forget that tomorrow. We have to remind ourselves. Okay. It seems, what do you mean? Oh. Well, it seems like on a grounded level that too when we look at it, how many times a day do I think I have and I have not? And are we choosing to recreate that karmic path ourselves? Um, rather than doing the also that you were talking about earlier. By noticing what I have and what I don't have? Yeah. I have, I have not, he has, she has, they have not. Is mm -hmm. that sort of that 
consciousness creating reality, then isn't it, isn't it that simple? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is that simple. Here's our five physical senses. Here's our inner senses. Our inner senses do have the ability to look on everything from God's perspective, from the angelic perspective, from the whatever you want to call it, superconscious perspective. I don't like words, but whatever you say is an elevated perspective, okay? Everything we see that's wrong is coming strictly from the five physical senses. The part of us that believes we are all separate and one can harm the other. We are not separate. One cannot harm the other. Okay? That's not easy. We have to take a while to let that digest. Right? At the beginning of the Course in Miracles, it says, you aren't going to believe this. You aren't going to accept it. Right? You're going to even resist it. That's all right. Do it anyway. Right? The universe functions on intent. We're hung up on words also. We think, okay, mind creates. I need to... <laughs> we got an email from a woman in New York uh, that I met briefly, had a five-minute session. She, she, somebody else had told her that I could do readings, and so uh, she came in uh, where I was working and asked about her love life. Okay, she wanted her love life. So I told her, um, you know, everything there is to know about metaphysics and the uh, mystery school teachings in five minutes, right? <laughs> Joking, of course. Um, but uh, one of the things I, you know, I, I alluded to, she sees herself as unattractive, so she won't get a man, so she had to change her image. Uh, and I said, uh, you need to know what you want. Right? And so we got this email, and it had 31 things that I want in a man. Right? <laughs> I want the man to be this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and there 31 things. Okay? That's the way the secret would tell you to do it. Okay? Doesn't work. God never created that person. She's going to have a long wait, uh, waiting for this individual who has no karmic issues, and therefore wouldn't be on planet Earth anyway. Right? <laughs> <laughs> If you get into relationship, uh, Patricia Sun says you get into relationship with people who have matching garbage, right? Because it's all about forgiveness. It's all about letting go of your karma. So you meet people who have matching garbage and you can choose to resist it or resist not evil. And again, The Course in Miracles says, you know, the greatest miracle is when an ancient um, uh, uh, ancient foes become new friends, right? Uh, that's when we're catching on to what's going on here, right? You did me wrong, I'll never forgive you. Okay. You know, the universe actually has a place called never, and you can stay there forever and have the same argument over and over and over, lifetime after lifetime, millennium after millennium, right? Big bang after big bang, if you want to, right? But why not give it up right now? Right? So, anytime we see something that is an error, we know that's my karma speaking. Why do I judge it to be an error? Because A, I have guilt about having been the perpetrator of that wrong in the first place. I don't remember that. It was a thousand lifetimes ago. Okay? But I was the perpetrator. Okay? I have the ability to release, not correct, or fix, or fight, or point out what's wrong with them, but to release, okay? I have the ability to use my inner senses, and we have to develop our inner senses. If we don't rely on our inner senses, we will never see justice on the earth. We will never see love on the earth. If we rely on our outer senses, on our physical senses, we will always believe that leukemia is bad. Right? Anne was relating to me, if I can use my wife as an example, I didn't ask her if I could do that, but she was relating uh, a past life experience in which she could see that she enrolled to starve to death so that she would learn certain things about how planet Earth worked. And she saw herself signing up for that class and coming in and taking that class and starving to death and 
going back to the other side and looking on it and say, yeah, we did that one good. Yeah, that was all right. But other people would have said, that's tragedy, right? There is no tragedy. God would not allow tragedy. If you believe in tragedy, if you believe in error, brace yourselves here. If you believe in tragedy or believe in error, you do not believe in God. You cannot believe in both. Those are opposing concepts. If there is a God, there's no tragedy, there's no error, there's nothing wrong. Tough stuff, okay? Don't have to believe it now. Don't have to accept it now, okay? The universe works on intent. We think mind creates. Okay, so I've got to verbalize this. I've got to make a mental picture. I've got to have, you know, I've got to read the secret and do it exactly like it says to do it. All right. The universe says, what, what did Jesus say? The Father knows what things you have need of before you even think about them, before you even think to ask, right? There's no time. All time is simultaneous time. You know, the universe knows your future and your past and everything as one simultaneous existence. Any thought you could think, any need you could come up with, the universe already anticipated it. Okay? So you just need to state, my, state your intent. And keep it simple. We're left brain people. We think God won't understand it if I don't write a dissertation and put it in a binder and hand it to him. Right? What is your intent? My intent is to be happy. My intent is to be as I have always been. Perfect, divine, complete. God, God, very God, most high. State your intent. Forget about the details. Details will bog you down. That's what your parents and teachers taught you was to come up with the details. Jesus didn't say anything about, about get the details straight and you can enter the kingdom of God. I, I don't see that in there anywhere. Right? Just rest in the love of God and you're home. But my therapist said I had to handle this. Be your own therapist. Go inside and say, what do I need to do to be free of this situation? And don't be surprised at the answers. When the answer is, go sit by the lake. I got that once. That was one of my answers. I was facing bankruptcy. I had a a, a engineering business that was going broke. I had to make more sales immediately. I was desperate for sales. I'm on my way to another city to open some new accounts to get some new business and thinking I have to do this or I'm going down the drain. And as I'm driving down the interstate, the voice is saying, go sit by that lake. But you don't understand. I'll lose my business if I don't. Go sit by the lake. I didn't go sit by the lake. I went and made new sales, and I lost my business anyway. The universe knows what it's doing, knows what you want, knows where you're coming from, knows where you're going to. Don't have to explain anything to the universe, right? It's got you all figured out. You ask questions and the answers don't match, but that's all right. <laughs> Did that make sense? Okay. Other questions? There there. Another question, um, and it's a, a broad question about the aging process. And from your perspective, how do you look at the aging process, and how, do, how does one age gracefully? You answered your question. But what else is there, right? Why would we set up a system in which we, the bodies that we choose to come into have a limited lifetime? Why would we do that? Maybe we get in a rut and we need to start all over again without a memory of what we did last time. 
Maybe when you've been here long enough, you're just recycling yesterday over and over and over. Lots of stories, whether they're mythology or ancient Bible stories or whatever, about people living hundreds, thousands of years. There's nothing magic about 90-year lifetime. Right? How long do you want to live? I think there's better places to go, personally, but you may, you may think this is great. Yeah. You know, I, re I remember up at our hermitage, where we live out in the desert uh, up there, um, an Indian uh, fellow from uh, the state of Washington was out. Uh, his, his tribe had been disappearing, and there weren't any elders left to teach the children, and so his mother sent him to be with the Navajo. And he came to our sweat lodges that we had on our land, and um, one day he addressed me as an elder of the tribe. And, you know, I was like blown away. And I thought, man, Boy, getting older is really cool. This is neat, you know. They look at you as an elder, right? And invited to be in the council. And it, that, that was, I thought that's pretty special, you know. Would I like to be where I was 30 years ago? Never again. Never would I choose to go back there. I like where I am right now. This is pretty super. And I really like where I'm going to be next month. That's just wonderful. Yeah. Anything else? When, um, when you get new ideas, when, when new inspiration comes to you, um, it's often the most common thing, the first, the first thing our minds do is they want to analyze it. So when you get a new idea, when a new inspiration comes to you, um, do you immediately just let it have its place and, and say, ah, so, and let it sit there? Or do you have a process that you use to internalize it, to uh, poke around and see if you've gotten the whole concept before you say, OK, I, I, I will allow this to just be. I think that's a fabulous question because I have dealt with that, you know, a lot. Um, I got, not too long ago actually, I got two words given to me. And they were awareness, which also you know, the way things come, not as words, but it was awareness, but it was also observe. Okay? And I got cynicism. Yeah. Um, and when I got the word awareness, it was like it contained the commandment to observe, but don't analyze, watch. Okay? And, you know, again, that's not an easy thing to do. When you get something that's contrary to your old belief system, and your old belief system is wrong. If it weren't wrong, you would have graduated and you wouldn't be here anymore. So I know your old belief system is wrong, right? You believe in limitation. You believe you have to do this and this to get this and all that. You know, that's life on Earth. That's what we believe here. That's the prerequisites for coming here. You have to believe that. So. Um, a new thought, a new awareness comes in to just say also, even when it seems nonsensical, it seems that doesn't fit the pattern of anything I know about on planet Earth. But by just observing, just looking, I, I, somebody gave me the concept many, many years ago. Uh, I was a Silva mind control instructor. Uh, gave me the concept of the mental shelf. Said you have, visualize a shelf in your mind, right? 
up on the wall. And anything that you cannot figure out, you put on the mental shelf. You don't discard it. You don't throw it away. You just set it on the mental shelf. So I have a mental shelf. It has a lot of things on it uh, sitting up there waiting to understand what they are. Yeah. Um, so my first word was awareness or observance. And since I got that word, it's like new ideas come in faster than ever now because you know, they can't come in if you're still analyzing the last one, right? But if you're not analyzing the last one, the new concept can come in. Okay? And the other word was cynicism. And along with that, I got, you have been teaching about miracles. You have been telling stories of miracles that other people have done, but you don't really believe it because you're not doing them. Get with the program. That was kind of what that one meant. Right? I was very cynical about miracles. And we've seen some amazing things since. Yeah. So everything that comes, comes for, for a reason. Reason might be to release it, don't need that anymore. Or might be, this contains a greater understanding. Put it on the shelf and you will eventually get what it means. Does that help? Yeah. Um, you guys up for some guided meditation and uh, practicing with the inner senses, that sort of thing? I think what I'd like to do is get kind of personal with this. So um, if you're sitting next to somebody that you know well, that you came with your partner or whatever, um, pick somebody else. Let's get two or three people in a group and make little two or three chair groups with people you don't know, because then they won't have judgments about you and what you're saying, stuff like that, OK? And we'll start off, I'll um, lead some guided meditations to familiarize us with our inner senses and then turn it over to you guys to guide each other. Um, get, get real comfortable. I know most of you guys do meditation and you have your own uh, way that you get yourself in an altered state of consciousness. Um, it's good to get another approach now and then. So I'll, I'll kind of walk us into that. Then in each group, if there are two or three of you, um, decide who's going to be um, the facilitator first and who's going to be the facilitator second, who's going to be the facilitator third uh, among yourselves right now. And then when I finish, um, uh, the f whoever's going to be the facilitator can query one of, or the other of the people in the group as to what insights they are getting. Um, uh, Non-directive uh, facilitating, okay? No suggestions, just uh, what did you get? How does that apply? Is that something we could all use? Or you'll know what to say. You'll just get it from guidance, what you're supposed to say. And then rotate around and another person ask be the facilitator, right? So everybody gets a chance. And if, um, for me, whether I'm the facilitator or I'm being queried, it helps me to keep my eyes closed. Uh, you may work better with your eyes open, I don't know. Uh, but whatever's comfortable for you. I always found it interesting how uh, some people say there is a correct meditative position um, and all that. I, I never knew that. I learned to meditate with my legs crossed and my arms folded. And people told me, you can't do that. But <laughs> that's the way I learned. And so that's a trigger mechanism for me now. When I sit down, cross my legs, fold my arms, I'm out there. Right? So anything can be your trigger mechanism. You don't have to sit with your th thumbs and fingers together or whatever. Right? Whatever works for you uh, is great. OK. Uh, at whatever point it's comfortable for you, you can close your eyes if you're comfortable with your eyes closed. Uh, always maintain your comfort level, uh, whatever that is. Okay. Uh, start by taking slow, deep breaths. Just take two or three slow, deep breaths and feel <coughs> the oxygen move through your body. It relaxes your muscles, 
Oxygen is the great healer of the body. Taking slow, deep breaths releases stress. Slow, deep breaths causes your muscular structure, your organs uh, to relax, to function better. Just taking a few slow, deep breaths each day can extend your life. Okay. Get yourself very comfortable. Use your outer senses now. Your eyes may be closed, but you can still see some light coming through your eyelids. Use your ears. Listen to the sounds that are in the room, maybe air conditioning, my voice, Bob's moving the camera around, whatever you might hear. Okay? Use your sense of uh, touch, your, your sense of feel. What is the air temperature in the room? Okay? Get very comfortable with your outer senses. And then we're going to allow our outer senses to move into the background. They're always there. If the need arises, if there's an emergency or whatever, your outer senses will alert you. They stay there. We we'll just let them comfortably drift into the background. And then we want to become aware of our inner senses. We have the physical senses on the inside. You have an inner sense of sight, an inner sense of feel, inner sense of smell, inner sense of touch, inner sense of hearing, and you have other inner senses that give you an awareness of a larger reality. What is your favorite flower? Imagine that your favorite flower is in front of you. Make it any size that you want, any color that you want. Your inner sense of vision is very keen. You can see great detail in your flower. Use your inner sense of touch in your mind. Reach out, pick up your flower, feel the texture of the stem, Feel the texture of the petals. <coughs> Rotate the flower. Look at it from different perspectives. You have an inner sense of smell. With your inner sense of smell, find out what the fragrance of this flower is. You may not think of flowers as making sounds, but your flower does make sounds that can be heard by your inner sense of hearing. Listen carefully to your flower. What sounds does it make? Put your inner tongue on a petal of the flower. Does it have a taste? This flower is going to be, for this evening, your reference point. If at any time you feel like you are disoriented or not sure where you're going or what you are doing in your <coughs> mind's eye, Simply pick up your flower, and you'll be right back here. Imagine now that you're standing near a grove of trees, and you are on a path. There is lush grass around, and your path is dirt. It is soft. The sun is out. Adjust the temperature around you to be the perfect temperature for you. Take off your shoes. Take off so you have bare feet. Feel the dirt beneath your feet.
begin to walk along the path slowly towards the grove of trees, feeling, <laughs> feeling the earth, feeling the sun, seeing the grass, seeing the trees, seeing the sky. What is the fragrance that you smell? Your path leads into the trees. As you walk into the trees, you're in the shade. Feel the difference in the temperature on your skin. Feel the coolness of the path beneath your feet. You notice that with your inner senses, you are aware of the life in the trees. You are aware of the life in the animals and the birds that are in this grove of trees. You are aware that you can communicate with everything that has life, and everything has life. Find a tree a particular tree, put your arms around the tree, ask the tree, what is your purpose in being? The answer may come as words, thoughts, ideas, feelings. You sense answers in your own unique way. Ask your tree, what is your purpose in being? Give thanks to this tree for having communicated with you. Walk along your path. You see ahead a clearing, lush green grass, bright sunlight. A clearing in the grove of trees. In the center of this clearing is a bench. Walk slowly across the grass, feeling the grass blades between your toes, feeling the temperature, hearing the sounds of the animals and birds in the trees. Walk to your bench and sit comfortably. Just absorb the beauty and the peace of this place. Look back now towards the path that brought you to this clearing. You will see another individual coming along that path slowly. <coughs> this is an awakened being, perhaps a guide of yours, perhaps your own higher self, perhaps someone from the angelic kingdom does not matter. This is a being that has answers for you. Invite this being into your clearing and to your bench to sit beside you. This being has something to convey to you, something that will be beneficial for you. Again, be aware of how you receive information as words or feelings or as a sense, <coughs> as a knowing. However you receive information is correct. Ask the being 
to give you the message and receive. If you could ask this being one question, what would that question be? Ask. See if you receive an answer. Give thanks to this individual for assisting you, for caring about you. You may sense what your connection is with this individual. This individual has always been with you and will always be with you. So as you rise from the bench and walk back across the grass to the path, you walk together. Feeling the grass, feeling the sunshine. <coughs> back into the grove of trees where it is cool. Feel the dirt beneath your feet. back through the trees. As you emerge from the grove of trees, you can see where you left your shoes. Put your shoes back on. You do not need to say thank you to this being, for they, can, they have no choice but to love you. You do not need to say goodbye because they never leave. With your shoes on, walk back to the starting point where you got onto the path. Take a deep breath. Feel very relaxed, very comfortable, very peaceful. The facilitator in each group will ask one of you about your experience. Share only what is comfortable to share. Share what you think might be useful to other people to hear. The facilitator may keep their eyes closed or open their eyes, <coughs> whatever is comfortable. We'll take a few minutes now and begin sharing. Mm -hmm. So what we're interested in is doing our lives differently. We want to be aware that it's up to us as to when we step off the wheel of karma. It's not up to a process. It's not up to a timetable. It's not up to anything except our own decision uh, as to when we wish to end the pain and struggle, step into the light, be blissful, be happy, uh, and the rules exist, 
and the rules say, don't believe anything your five physical senses tell you. Use your inner senses. See everything from God's perspective, right? If God is, big question, if God is, then love is the only thing that exists. And anything that you perceive that does not look like love means it's time to adjust our perception. Let's get the perception that God has of what's going on here. We will be masters. Masters are saviors. They do save this entire school system not by doing anything. There is nothing to be done. They save the entire school system by the fact that they are here. They are merged with a telepathic pool of consciousness, making master consciousness available to every being on the planet. We can't force them to accept it, but it's there when they choose to accept it. Over the next 40 years, there's going to be a crescendo. There's going to be coming from everywhere, masters, miracle workers. The whole 2,600 years of the Aquarian Age is the restoration of the Garden of Eden, is when we start taking asphalt off the planet, we start removing high-rise buildings, we start living a oneness with nature. It's normal. It happens every 26,000 years when we come around to the Aquarian Age. The mythology about the Garden of Eden isn't a myth. It's real. It always happens. You will be a facilitator of that happening again simply because you choose to say, ah, so. There was a master come to, unto the earth, born in the holy land of Indiana, raised in the mystical hills east of Fort Wayne. The master learned of this world in the public schools of Indiana, and as he grew in his trade as a mechanic of automobiles. But the master had learnings from other lands and other schools, from other lives he had lived. Sound familiar? He remembered these, and remembering became wise and strong, so that others saw his strength and came to him for counsel. The master believed that he had the power to help himself and all of mankind, and as he believed, so it was for him, so that others saw his power and came to him to be healed of their troubles and their many diseases. The master believed that it is well for any man to think upon himself as a son of God. And as he believed, so it was. And the shops and garages where he worked became crowded and jammed with those who th sought his learning and his touch. And the streets outside with those who longed only that the shadow of his passing might fall upon them and change their lives. It came to pass because of the crowds, that the several foremen and the shop managers bid the master to leave his tools and go his way, for so tightly was he thronged that neither he nor the other mechanics had room to work upon the automobiles. So it was that he went into the countryside, and people following began to call him Messiah and worker of miracles. And as they believed, so it was. If a storm passed as he spoke, not a raindrop touched a listener's head, and the last of the multitude heard his words as clearly as the first, no matter lightning nor thunder in the sky about. And always he spoke to them in parables, and he said unto them, Within each of us lies the power of our consent 
to health and to sickness, to riches and to poverty, to freedom and to slavery. It is we who control these and not another. A millman spoke and said, Easy words for you, Master, for you're guided as we are not, and need not toil as we toil. A man has to work for his living in this world. The Master answered and said, Once there lived a village of creatures along the bottom of a great crystal river. The current of the river swept silently over them all, young and old, rich and poor, good and evil, the current, lit current going its own way, knowing only its own crystal self. Each creature in its own manner clung tightly to the twigs and rocks of the river bottom, for clinging was their way of life, and resisting the current, what each had learned from birth. But one creature said at last, I'm tired of clinging. Though I cannot see it with my eyes, I trust that the current knows where it is going. I shall let go and let it take me where it will. For clinging, I shall die of boredom. The other creatures laughed and said, You fool, let go, and that current you worship will throw you tumbled and smashed across the rocks, and you'll die quicker than boredom. But the one heeded them not, and taking a breath did let go, and at once was tumbled and smashed by the current across the rocks. Yet in time, as the creature refused to cling again, the current lifted him free from the bottom, and he was bruised and hurt no more. And the creatures downstream, to whom he was a stranger, cried, See a miracle, a creature like ourselves, yet he flies. See the Messiah, come to save us all. And the one carried in the current said, I am no more Messiah than you. The river delights to lift us free, if only we dare let go. Our true work is this voyage, this adventure. But they cried the more, Savior, all the while clinging to the rocks. And when they looked again, he was gone, and they were left alone to make legends of a Savior. And it came to pass, when he saw that the multitude thronged him the more day on day, tighter and closer and fiercer than ever they had, when he saw that they pressed him to heal them without rest and feed them always with these miracles, to learn for them and live their lives for them, he went alone that day into a hilltop apart, and there he prayed. And he said in his heart, Infinite radiant is, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Let me lay aside this impossible task. I cannot live the life of one other soul, yet ten thousand cry to me for life. I'm sorry I allowed it all to happen. If it be thy will, let me go back to my engines and my tools, and let me live as other men. And a voice spoke to him on the hilltop, a voice neither male nor female, neither loud nor soft, a voice infinitely kind. And the voice said unto him, Not my will, but thine be done. For what is thy will is mine for thee. Go thy way as other men, and be thou happy on the earth. And hearing, the master was glad, and gave thanks, and came down from the hilltop, humming a little mechanic song. And when the throng pressed him with its woes, beseeching him to heal for it, and learn for it, and feed it nonstop from his understanding, and to entertain it with his wonders, he smiled upon the multitude, and said pleasantly unto them, I quit. <clears throat> For a moment the multitude was stricken dumb with astonishment. And he said unto them, If a man told God that he wanted most of all to help the suffering world, no matter the price to himself, and God answered and told him what he must do, should the man do as he is told? Of course, Master, cried the many. It should be pleasure for him to suffer the tortures of hell itself, should God ask it. No matter what those tortures, nor how difficult the task, 
Honor to be hanged, glory to be nailed to a tree and burned, if so be that God has asked, said they. And what would you do, the master said unto the multitude, if God spoke, spoke directly to your face and said, <clears throat> I command that you be happy in the world as long as you live. What would you do then? The multitude was silent. Not a voice, not a sound was heard upon the hillsides across the valleys where they stood. And the master said unto the silence, In the path of our happiness shall we find the learning for which we have chosen this lifetime. So it is that I have learned this day and choose to leave you now to walk your own path as you please. And he went his way through the crowds and left them and returned to the everyday world of men and machines. Shalom.